Thanks, everybody. Uh, we appreciate you uh, attending this session. We'll be talking about how to scale your Microsoft Link Network without complexity. And I know there's a lot of other sessions going on, so hopefully we've got some content here that you'll find interesting and informative. My name's Lynn Garrick. I'm a, one of several systems engineering directors with Brocade, and I will be uh, talking about some of the unique characteristics that um, Brocade can bring to both data center and campus networks um, in support of the link environment. I'll give you a little insight into the agenda that we're going to talk about today. Um, before we get started, though, let me uh, see a raise of hands in terms of who's uh, architects, uh, with networking background and who's kind of um, maybe delivery folks that are tasked with installing and maintaining and who, who are people that just kind of have a business focus. I realize this is a session 300 level, uh, but uh, I thought it'd be interesting. So network architects, folks doing design work, a pretty good uh, mix. Uh, deployment folks, installation folks, hand on, hands on technicians, okay. You're doing both of them. Good for you. How about business guys? Anybody just looking at the business aspect? Okay, good, good. So we got, we've got a pretty good mix. So I'm gonna be probably right down the middle, some technical uh, detail that uh, you'll find interesting, but I'm also gonna give you a little bit of a business insight into why you should consider some of the topics that we're gonna talk about. So from an agenda standpoint, uh, what I'm gonna do is, is handle and talk through some IT trends that are relevant across IT in general. In particular, though, they're relevant to a Microsoft Link environment. Um, and so we find these trends complementary to rolling out other applications above and beyond Link. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the Link requirements from a user perspective. And that's both on the enterprise side of the business as well as a managed service provider space. Some things that are obvious in a managed service provider space, you're dealing with more than just one client, right? And so there's some unique network requirements that uh, you have to consider for Link, um, and that we also provide with uh, our solution set. Then I'm going to run through some best practices, and the best practices are going to revolve around some terms that you may not be familiar with. Uh, you may have heard of Ethernet Fabric. Uh, I'm going to delve into that and let you understand what Ethernet Fabric is and why it's relevant to Microsoft Link infrastructure. HyperEdge is unique uh, brocade terminology, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what that means. Then we'll talk about server load balancing, the link server environment, uh, fiber channel storage, as well as some of the other storage uh, components and technologies that may be involved, the data center core, uh, and what's unique about a data center core and supporting link um, as part of the overall architecture, and comprehensive management, which is interfaces of element managers, plugins, uh, and integration of other components into the overall Microsoft in, uh, management environment. And then something that's kind of unique that's starting to spring out with some of the customers, which is you, know, you normally can acquire product and services through capital acquisition, leasing. Um, there's another alternative here that we'll talk about. And then I'm going to leave some time at the end for questions and answers. Okay? Great. So major IT trends, what, uh, what we see going on in the enterprise are really um, some significant trends. And to probably nobody's surprise is we see a lot of enterprises trying to reduce cost. You know, with that, there's a consolidation effort that's going on and the continuing effort at reducing complexity. You know, so as IT has become really kind of a mainstream function of any enterprise, you know, just like the accounting or the sales group or anything, IT's got its own identity. There's been a continual focus on it to reduce complexity. And I would say for the most part, it's been rather unsuccessful. Uh, so there's some technologies that we'll talk about today that you'll see have a very big impact on complexity. With that, it also enables the velocity of being able to deploy applications a lot quicker uh, and the nobody's surprise with the movement of virtualization and some of the other trends in application development, everything's moving toward a service-oriented orientation. In the public cloud or managed service provider space, some other things to consider. Any partners here or anybody uh, part of a managed service provider? 
somebody that actually deploys Link as a service? Okay, just kind of some things I think you'll probably give the check mark and the, and the approval stamp to. You've got to be able to support multi-tenancy, and that's a big topic, and I'll dive into a little bit about what multi-tenancy means. And then you want to get the most out of your infrastructure and resources as possible. Back to the enterprise bullet about reducing complexity, you want to be able to automate and orchestrate because you're servicing multiple customers with multiple requirements, and the more simple you can make it through orchestration and automation, the better off you are. And then the ability to, in real time, scale the environment, and this is a key point, without disrupting the service of those clients that are already on the network. Bit of a trick, right? Because anybody in here, whether you're a managed service provider, an architect, or a technician deploying units, you realize there's really not much of a downtime window anymore, right? So the, you know, we're gonna give you, you know, an hour at 2 a.m. on Sunday. Um, those days were fading into the background. So it's really difficult, and it's why we chose the theme of how to scale your network without complexity because it's a bit of a trick to, to elevate some of the technologies without interrupting service. I talked a little bit about it. Um, there's a trend toward acquisition methods right now that moves away from purchase, where you make a capital purchase, um, or lease equipment services, to now acquiring it as an operating cost. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but when you think about cloud infrastructures, and buying services by the drink, only as much as you need, kind of a consumption-based acquisition model, we, along with a couple other manufacturers, are now starting to offer the ability to, to acquire our hardware and software via an operating cost, meaning we still retain the title to it. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's flexibility so that you don't have to overbuild your network and leave some assets unutilized. So those trends are what we kind of see going on um, in the IT space. I'm going to talk a little bit now about link drivers, and this is from a network perspective, right? Things to consider as you either build out your link deployment or you try and scale it. There's some things here that are pretty relevant um, in terms of uh, the link environment. First thing, if you got anything out of this conference from all the Microsoft keynote spe speeches and breakouts, you realize that they really want to blend together link with, uh, with Skype, and so the consumerization is really a big piece. The business imperatives of trying to able to wring costs out of the business is probably as big an initiative that's going on in IT right now. Everybody's focused on the bottom line, how do we squeeze more money out of the operation, and we use IT as a vehicle to help do that. Uh, like everybody, I've got the mobile device in my pocket. Uh, you can't get up in the morning and not realize that mobility is maybe one of the biggest trends uh, along with squeezing cost out of the business, but one of the biggest trends going on in IT right now. And globalization. I was over in Europe last week, and I was living and dying by link. And the flexibility of being out of the country, or being remote, or being mobile, and still having IT capabilities, like you're sitting right at your desk, behind your own machine, is incredible. So how do you do this? Uh, with, with link, um, one last topic to really discuss is that they are tremendously focused, Microsoft is, on providing a user experience that's very palatable. That means a quality of experience as opposed to a quality of service or a class of service. The focus is on the user perception. So if the user is not satisfied, then it doesn't look and feel like a successful deployment. The other piece that goes along with that is the ability to move between fixed and wired clients, whether they're hard clients or soft clients, and have that experience look and feel as much as the same as possible. Not exactly the same because of the difference in the mobile devices with the, with the fixed wired devices and hard clients and soft clients, but in, in general, try and adapt so that no matter how the user connects, they have that capability that looks and feels native to them. And then the ability to accumulate some real-time metrics in support of delivering the application successfully. So that's really kind of the user experience that Microsoft is looking to capture as well as monitor. Now, from a standpoint of uh, link network requirements, this is kind of setting the table for some of the technology discussion. You have to put a network in place that has consistent latency meaning I don't have a lot of variable latencies across my network components in the data center, 
The WAN's probably out of your control, right, unless you have a private backbone of some sort. You know, you're going to be tied to a public service provider and whatever their offering is. But then out into the campus, I've got a multimedia application. It's voice over IP. It's video. It's unified messaging. And it's got to live with the rest of your applications, either in your managed service provider environment where there's other tenants or in the enterprise where you've got other applications living next to it. Load balance servers. If you get any type of scale behind the link environment, you'll know that you've got to load balance those servers. Um, so when you have multiple servers in place, whether it's in the enterprise or the managed service provider space, you've got to have a load balancer. Managed service provider space, that ability to have multiple tenants, have them very clearly delineated in terms of their use of the infrastructure so you can provide good quality of service. The ability to use whatever storage infrastructure suits your needs, whether it's Fiber Channel, uh, NAS, or iSCSI. Then the adaptive endpoint uh, support that we talked about. And then a the trend now that I'm sure everybody's aware of is being able to support virtualized link application delivery as well as virtualizing the network itself. And then one thing that we did as a company uh, that I think was very, very significant is we've got our portfolio for a link environment validated by Microsoft. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail. A little bit about voice quality, uh, because there's a lot more to voice quality than, um, than really meets the eye. You know, you've got the real-time effective bandwidth, meaning how much of my pipe is really available for transporting voice, which means you, know, you need quality of service and the ability to provide that quality of service from the origination point to the destination point. Again, in the middle from some of the wide area service providers, it's kind of up in the air. But then you've got issues around delay and latency. And so when you think about latency, some folks just think about absolute latency, point A to point B and how long does it take. In there, though, are some subcomponents like processing delay, Every time you go through a piece of hardware, there's processing delay that's involved, serialization of taking an analog signal at some point and getting it into a packetized format, the absolute delay of the network itself and the physics of the media. Uh, and all this kind of wraps around with, you've got about 150 milliseconds uh, from ITU that they think is reasonable for you to get good voice quality across the network. So that's kind of your budget to work with. One of the other things that you absolutely want to avoid is packet loss. If you start pitching frames, it kind of comes through to the user as just choppy voice, where you don't really you know, get the entire conversation in one smooth, homogenous stream. And then jitter. Jitter is actually an effect of variable latency throughout the network. So if you've got some components in place, and you get 200 milliseconds, and then you drop down to 35, 40 milliseconds, and you go back up, and this latency is not fairly smooth across the network, you get the phenomena called jitter, and that really starts to impact your voice quality. So one of the trickier aspects of Link is being able to provide, to the extent that you have control over it, is consistent latency through the network. Absolute latency is something else to consider, right? You get out too far, then you're starting to run up against the 150 millisecond ceiling. From a managed service provider space, and I know we don't have too many of those folks in here, but it's worth looking at. You've got to have client separation, virtual routing and forwarding tables, individual instances of the routing tables that are discrete for that particular client, network services, DNS, DHCP, those type of things you have to deploy, and then uh, operational administrative management and provisioning capabilities for multiple tenants as simple as possible. And then on the WAN services side, you want to have resilient services wherever you can. Fault tolerant WAN access, if you look at what the big, um, not the big, one of the big uh, concerns with healthcare.gov was they were single threaded in a couple of places. They weren't single threaded, they had catastrophic WAN failure that isolated one of the data centers. SIP trunks, I'll ask the question, everybody familiar with what a SIP trunk is or what SIP is? Anybody not familiar with it? So for the masses, so SIP trunks uh, are session initiation protocol, a text-based protocol, and it's the fundamental transport protocol for unified communications. 
How do you get a text message across? Well, the real easy way is just to take the text itself and put it in a frame and transport it. And so SIP has got the ability to, as a text-based protocol, to transport text as well as other forms of media. So it's very relevant for video conferencing, instant messaging, voice conversations, actual data transfer. And it's the intelligent trunk that a lot of wide area service providers will put in place. And in a multitude of gateways. You've got to get from analog endpoints into digital endpoints. You've got other things like session border control. But all those kind of blend into this multi-faceted managed service provider environment. So best practices. Let's talk about best practices. And this is uh, what I hope kind of gets your interest in terms of how we go about architecting a network to support link as well as some of the other applications in your network. The high block diagram, as you can see, you've got other partners um, getting their way into the DMZ, MSN, Yahoo, as well as the tenants and federated businesses. We're federated with Microsoft, so we look and feel like you know, federated clients from our link environment into the Microsoft link environment. Notice that there's PSTN aggregate or integration on the wide area side, uh, as well as the premise side. If you've got a PBX in place, you most likely have analog clients in place, hard clients. Uh, you've got to be able to get those guys into the link environment so you can participate in the dial plan um, and be part of the overall link experience. Sometimes you may use that for the audio and take advantage of the video conferencing or some of the instant messaging capabilities of link, but it's a nice way to bring in part of your infrastructure to the environment without throwing it away. Then you've got some of the back-end services like uh, archiving, DNS, DHCP, that sort of thing, and UM. So all this kind of rolls together into an infrastructure. What we did at Brocade um, is test out our components as part of the overall link solution. So this is kind of a partner-centric chart where it shows some but not all the partners. And what this gives you is a high degree of reliability in terms of the experts from Microsoft up in Redmond put this solution set together. And again, there's some other partners in here that could be you know, part of this architecture. I just chose this one chart because it was pre-built. Um, but you see where the brocade solution set fits in the data center core with an interface to the wide area network, uh, something called a VCS, which is an ethernet fabric that we'll spend a fair amount of time chatting about. Uh, then some of the handoff and isolation mechanisms between the different components, the core, the backend services, voice over IP systems, and then the fiber channel storage as well. So briefly, the components that we talked about um, and we'll talk about uh, are data center centric and campus centric. The data center revolves around our hardware-based load balancer for the link servers and Ethernet fabric as the primary data transport connecting to those servers. Uh, our storage fabric, which is fiber channel centric, uh, I'll talk about some of the other network-based uh, storage capabilities. Uh, the adapters, the I.O. adapters that go in the servers. Uh, that's NIC cards as well as host bus adapters. And then the core switching and routing. And what we did was we put this together. For those of you who are familiar with a um, virtual compute block, we built a, a brocade virtual compute block made up of the components that you can see right uh, above the core where it's uh, represented by our Ethernet fabric, network adapter, and storage fabric. So that essentially is compute, storage, and network paired up with the actual server platform itself to give you a kind of a prescriptive architecture to build it out. The idea here is because of virtualization being a key theme in a data center is to provide a flat, uh, fairly um, consistent network that spans many servers in the data center. When we talked about voice quality, remember I said variable latency was really a big topic of discussion. Well, the VCS fabric in the data center is one of the ways that we take that off the table uh, because it's built with a number of hardware components that connect in a very low latency, also with predictable delays, that is, be, is able to be multipath not only between the components in the fabric but the actual server environment itself. So what you have is predictable multipath resiliency where the link traffics 
have not only a primary and a secondary path, but they're equally utilized from the server on out into the network. When I talk about low latency, we're talking about microseconds and nanoseconds of latency. You know, most times you're talking the ITU 150 milliseconds, right? It's 150 milliseconds. We're talking about throughputs that are predictable in the micro and nanosecond environments. So that's uh, fairly significant. We can also, for the service provider environments, cut these up into virtual fabrics where we can allocate pieces of this Ethernet fabric, this virtual cluster switch is the brand name for it. We can allocate pieces of it to individual clients. And then almost as interestingly, back to that theme of reducing complexity and making life a little simpler for everybody, um, we can bind the virtual MAC address to the actual port profile that's on the physical Ethernet fabric hardware. Interesting, but why would we want to do that? The reason is, is that VM has to move from a physical server, physical server 1, to physical server 6 for some reason, maintenance, capacity, just maybe even moving it to another data center. Binding that port profile to that virtual MAC address automatically configures the new port where that VM is moved to without any operator intervention. Pretty significant. We'll talk about some of the simplicity aspects as we get a little farther into it. Supports all the storage protocols that are of any relevance in a data center. That's fiber channel, fiber channel over Ethernet, which means all the sophisticated, relatively recently released quality of service and queuing mechanisms for fiber channel over Ethernet, as well as NAS and iSCSI. NAS may seem like a no-brainer, but like any storage protocol, it's pretty interested in having a low, predictable latency network in place to support it. So some of the things that you'll find with Link, right, are actually fairly similar to the requirements for a storage environment. Give me low latency, give me resiliency, give me predictable latencies. So it's kind of a natural that brocades heritage from the storage environment is kind of moved over to this Ethernet fabric world. From a greenfield and a brownfield perspective, hey, you know what, it seems pretty simple to put in greenfield product, but when you do that, you want to make sure that it's got some legs so you can continue to evolve it. So this is 1 gig interfaces, 10 gig interfaces, 40 gig interfaces, and 100 gig interfaces. So from an I.O. standpoint, a lot of 10 gig interfaces into the servers, um, but as you scale the trunks, both internal to the fabric and up to the core, there's enough leg room in there that you can scale this out significantly. Next chart, I'll talk about some of the unique attributes when we talk about upgrading the switch. So here's our classical three-tier architecture in a data center. Anybody within networking is going to look at this and go, yep, I recognize it. Access, distribution, core, one link's active, one link's blocked because I'm running spanning tree, but I've got to have a backup path in case I have an outage. Traffic flows are north and south. Traffic comes out of the server and goes north, it has to go to another subnet, then it's routed in the core, back down into that server. It has to leave the data center, then it's routed outside the data center. So the trick with that is it's pretty inflexible, managing a bunch of boxes that are connected together, inefficient, only half the inf infrastructure is utilized, right? The rest of it's sitting there idle in case something happens. I have a hardware failure, a link gets pulled by somebody, whatever. And it's complex, so there's a lot to it. Doesn't have any understanding of virtual machines either. It's just sitting there going, whatever, give me the traffic, I'll forward it up. I'll take a look at the packet, forward it layer two or layer three, whatever makes the most sense. Fundamentally, here is what an Ethernet fabric transforms this to look at. Is it a single box? No. No, it's a lot of different boxes. But it is flexible uh, because some of the technology that's brocade is adapted from its fiber channel storage portfolio allows you to connect those components arbitrarily. Is there a best practice? Absolutely. What's that best practice look like? Eh, it kind of looks like an access and a distribution layer. The difference is this virtual cluster switching molds it into a common infrastructure that looks and feels like one network element. So now when I start talking about low latency, predictable latencies, um, being able to move traffics through those two layers with a high degree of confidence, um, you start to realize that there's some, there's some similarities between supporting storage environments and real-time multimedia applications like Link. 
It's efficient because we load balance the traffic automatically. When you build the fabric and you connect these components together, give an address, they discover each other, you don't have to do another configuration. I don't have enough bandwidth between the servers, between the switches in the fabric, because it's interconnected multi-path traffics between these switches. Add a connection, it's up and running. No configuration. And the traffic is striped better than 95% efficiency, meaning the traffic's down those links between the switches or between the servers are distributed evenly, um, not 100%, but almost 100%. If you use software-based um, hash algorithms, you're somewhere between 65 and 80%. One link's going to have you know, roughly 15, 20% more traffic on it just because of the way the hash, hash algorithm works. Very efficient when you're talking about video, when you're talking about voice quality, high bandwidth. This is a very simplistic way to build out this portion of your network. It looks like a logical switch, so the simplicity when you manage it, build a config, push it out to one switch, populates the rest of the environment. Don't have to touch it. Multiplexed at the trunk level for efficiency, uses Trill as the interconnect of all these different switch components, and then has multiple layer three gateways in place if you decide to put the layer three gateway functionality in the ethernet fabric and not in the core. So really resilient, and as I mentioned, you can bind that virtual MAC address with a port profile, and if you have VM mobility activities, you can move it and you don't even have to touch the ethernet fabric to put the port profile in place. Voice quality in the campus, surprise, surprise, <laughs> you look at the picture, the architecture is relatively similar to the data center. You need predictable delays, low latency elements. What we did there is we built a very uh, unique capability in our stackable portfolio. And the reason we did that is because we realized we could put distributed services along with just garden variety layer two user access ports into a single stack and get some of the benefits we just talked about in the data center. Comprehensive QoS, what do I mean by that? It means I've got enough queues, number of queues, um, and the flexibility to mark, remark, or pass traffic as it enters into the network from the user side. Most of the phones and some of the voice-centric applications are gonna come up expedited forwarded, right? Probably don't wanna fool with that. You may have some other applications that assign a quality of service marking prior to entry in the network. You can actually go in there and remark that. Um, so there's, it's very flexible in terms of quality of service. Again, greenfield and brownfield, it's easy enough to build it from the greenfield. This has the ability to scale. Both the data center, both the campus networks um, have the ability to use industry standard protocols and integrate into existing networks. So that's a key component because if you're looking to expand in your network uh, to support link, you may not have what you need in place. And so if you put this in, you gotta realize that you may want it part of your overall network infrastructure. Both of these have very complementary protocols for existing networks and that's standards based. We do something on the wireless side. Uh, we've got a partnership that's right now a selling partnership with Aruba. On down the road, we'll do some things that are kind of software defined network centric with them. Uh, I made note of that because we support wireless just as you heard in all the speeches today, a big theme is mobility. We can't necessarily ignore the fact that without a wireless LAN portfolio that you know, we're not gonna support it. So we support it and we're going along the lines of enhancing that uh, support with Aruba with some next generation capabilities. The differentiation as well in the campus space is around total cost of ownership. So you'll find that this is very competitive in terms of what we offer uh, with some of the other manufacturers from a pricing standpoint. Again, to look at this, here's the old three-tier model that I just talked about. Uh, we've got you know, an active standby spanning tree environment. Uh, we've got you know, some communications that are rather inefficient. Uh, the deployment time is box by box. What you get with the HyperEdge technology is what we've branded this is very efficient traffic flows because some of the layer two and layer three services all reside in the same stack. Uh, it's active-active. If you look at that core, I'll talk about it later, but those two core switches up there, both in the data center and in this campus environment, look like a single virtual switch connected together by some trunks. Um, and that 
whole capability now looks like one big switching infrastructure in the core. Very easily deployed, um, and just like the data center, policy and configuration sharing, we push it out to that hyper edge, meaning the, um, the stackables that you see in the drawing here, we push them out as a single entity. So we configure the environment, not a single switch. So I'll pause there. Any, any questions? Because I'm going to have some Q&A at the end, but that's a lot of content um, and probably some new concepts for anybody, particularly around Ethernet fabric. Anything that uh, I may have missed that you're going, well, wonder about, wonder if they can do that. Yeah. Are you uh, OpenStack is a key initiative for our entire portfolio at some point, um, both on virtual cluster switching, the Ethernet fabric and HyperEdge, we'll have OpenStack support. We don't have it right now. Now, server load balancing, right? So that's a little different uh, environment. You know, as I mentioned earlier, for Link, anything that has any scale to it, Microsoft recommends more than one Link server. And so if you have that in place, you want to be able to server load balance them because you want the environment to always be active. Uh, the hardware platform we have in place uh, ranges from a one RU box to a very dense 10 10 slot uh, unit. It also supports some of the things that maybe aren't quite so ob obvious when it comes to server load balancing or application delivery control. Global server load balancing, the ability to have those servers resident in different data centers that are geographically dispersed um, and be able to direct client traffic to that data center that's most relevant in terms of either geographic location or response times. We also support the uh, via an application called Application Resource Broker, uh, we support load balancing VMs. So if you deploy Link in a virtualized manner, the same hardware platform that server load balances physical servers can also load balance VMs located on different physical servers. Server one with an instance, a virtualized instance of Link, server two with a virtualized instance, those both can still be load balanced across this platform. Then we do some things in terms of support for denial of service, and distributed denial of service, rather than have to deploy an IDS or IPS platform resident here. And then, uh, unique to us is the ability, able, the ability to be able to support IPv4 or IPv6 independent of where that V6 or V4 environment exists. Here's what I mean. I've got V4 clients. I want to move to a V6 server infrastructure. This will do the translation between V4 and V6. Um, and we'll also have some of the V4 and V6 protocol capabilities that are resident there. I've got V6 clients. My server environment, including Link, uh, is a mix of V4 and V6 servers. It'll do the translation. I've got all six clients. I've got all six servers. They'll handle that as well. So we've actually used it as a tool to help migrate some of our users and clients from a V4 to a V6 application environment, also contained in this platform, as well as multi-tenancy. Just like the Ethernet fabric, right? You can take this hardware platform and you can cut it up and dedicate processing and hardware to individual clients across this hardware platform. You think about that in terms of, well, why do I care? Well, if you're a managed service provider, like the gentleman in the back, it'd be nice to be able to cut up your infrastructure and dedicate it to individual tenants. For all the rest of this stuff, this is about building that network support for the resiliency and the scalability of the link environment itself. Talk about fiber channel storage, because this is where Brocade was, frankly, built into a lot of solutions on the storage side from our OEM partners. Uh, what's in place right now is an 8 gig and a 16 gig fiber channel environment. It scales from the 1RU switches you see here up to multi-slotted chassis we call directors. Just like the other two instances of virtual fabric and server load balancers, we can cut this up into virtual fabrics and dedicate them to individual tenants. We can boot from SAN, which is an interesting process that takes away a bare metal server boot, and that you can now query the SAN and boot the operating image from the SAN environment instead of from the actual bare metal server itself. 
We've got a little bit different quality of service capability, but the ability to take traffics and allocate bandwidth to them from the storage on into the compute platforms is also something we do. And then very um, specifically, we can break out multipath I.O. from the servers. What do I mean by that? Well, I talked a little bit about our adapter uh, portfolio earlier that um, we were able to actually use this fabric adapter. Multipath I.O. is, uh, one, the ability to have an air gap between two like SAN environments. So you can take one out of service and either provide remedial maintenance or do something else to the other SAN. And so that air gap is something that's always been in place from the server through the HBAs on out to the A and B fabrics. What we did here is we came out with an adapter that has a dual personality as either NIC cards or HBAs or a combination of both. So a two port card, by changing the optics, you can have it look as a 10 gig NIC or an eight slash 16 gig fiber channel card or two, two fiber channel HBAs um, or two NIC cards. And the whole driver stack and support of both of those functions is already in place. So now when you talk about multipathing, you can put in a couple less NICs and still get two distinct paths out of your compute environment. Again, why do I care? You know, when you think back at the topic of this conversation is how do you scale your link network without complexity? As I add users or as I just want to grow my IT environment in general, how do you do that without interrupting traffic and taking an outage? And can I do it simplistically? So that's a little bit on the, on the uh, storage side. I'm well, talking about the, um, the core switch. I mentioned earlier the acronym MCT, multi-chassis trunking. By connecting those two links between these two core switches you see at the top of the uh, chart here, they look like one virtual switch. And the architecture is such that you can you know, remove the core logic because it's redundant. And so you've got nonstop forwarding in place. Unlike some of the other players, what's unique is this switch has a couple of, this router has a couple of personalities. In the data center, it can look like a layer two switch or a router. On the wide area side of it, you can actually deploy MPLS, um, Ethernet services, and some other wide area centric services as well. So the single switch is capable of having complementary personalities for the data center and the wide area. Other architectures would say, well, I need something as a core switch in the data center that I can hand off to a different switch that's facing the wide area. People architect their data centers like that. With this particular platform, you don't have to do that. Supports uh, virtual routing and forwarding. So again, for multi-tenancy, big key for the managed service providers, putting in a link environment with multiple tenancies. How do I get those address spaces so that I can assign them to each one of my tenants? And again, some forwarding care characteristics, 15.6 terabytes um, and industry leading 100 gig interfaces that can, by the way, be trunked together to provide even more bandwidth as a contiguous piece of bandwidth. So very scalable. And again, that's part of it. How do I, do, how do I build these networks that support the link traffics, the different multimedia types, and how do I do it non-disruptively and somewhat simplistically? So to this point, I've been talking about all these best practices that have been put into the Microsoft environment with Microsoft looking at them, documenting, working with Brocade, working with the other manufacturers to make sure that we've got a solution set that users um, and multi -serv managed service providers can deploy. So I'm going to go off a little bit here and talk about a topic that I think is pretty interesting but has not really been part of this architecture to this point. And that is something called software-defined networking with kind of a subtopic around something called network function virtualization. So network function virtualization is an offshoot of 20 large, predominantly telco-centric service providers who said, I am tired of buying a firewall here, a firewall there, and all these individual instances of firewalling. And I'm also tired of buying the same thing for IDS, IPS platforms, for um, session border controllers, for routers, for VPN appliances in general, why can't I have this as a VM that lives on common off the shelf compute hardware? And the answer is you can. So network function virtualization, virtualization 
um, is the instantiation of network functions that can be run as VMs on a compute platform as part of a hypervisor environment. And we're talking about x86 platforms, and we're talking about hypervisors that are the well-known hypervisors on the market. In this case, Hyper-V in particular, in support of Link, you know, others certainly are supported as well. But think about now that as I re-architect and want to scale my network and I need different functionalities, I may not have to buy the hardware platforms to acquire that functionality. And what am I talking about here? So I'm talking about routing, IPv4 or v6, and a lot of the same services that, uh, that are required. The routing protocols, some of the IP services, I'm talking about a stateful firewall, and I'm talking about VPNs, both network-based VPNs, IPsec, as well as application-based VPNs, SSLs. Well, so why is that a big deal? Because think about it as you want to scale or build out or evolve your network in support of Link or other applications, and you need some of that functionality. Instead of buying a piece of hardware, taking delivery, cabling it up, mounting it in the rack, mounting in the rack cabling up, or taking existing equipment and adding a blade or cable, this is a configuration exercise. You get into your compute platform, most probably a blade center, and you build a VM to support the functionality you need. And you can build them as a single instance of routing, stateful firewalling, VPNing, and I left one out, application delivery controlling or server load balancing. So now it's, well, hang on a second. So now I can do server load balancing, routing, any of these functions as discrete software-based functions on my compute platform, or I can chain them together in a service chain? And the answer is yes. The big uses for this is obviously, you know, just virtualizing the entire environment and simplifying and being able to scale your network non-disruptively, um, but the efficiencies um, and the simplicity of doing this from a management standpoint, pretty significant. The other thing that goes on here is if you take a bare metal off-the-shelf server and you apply this, this offering to a bare metal server, you've kind of got a branch router offering put in a compute platform, server OS, hypervisor, instance of routing, instance of firewalling, VPNing. I've now got access uh, over the public network. I've got a firewall. I've got routing capability if I want to build a network on the other side of that. And I've now got a compute instance with a hypervisor on it on a bare metal server. So it really changes what you can deploy now in a remote office. You don't need all these different little boxes. The other thing that goes on is when you think about, you know, link between data centers, I talked to a couple of folks and they went, oh, yeah, you know, but, you know, how do you do the DR and, you know, how do you keep these traffics, you know, between data centers in place? You can use the VPN capability, as you see here in the programmatic control by some of these uh, suppliers here. You can use them for data center to data center connectivities. Uh, there's a couple other bigger names up there we didn't mention. So suffice to say, this is not part of the architecture that we've tested with Microsoft, but quite a bit of interest from the user community, Microsoft, um, and some of our managed service providers as well. So the overall management aspect of this, if you uh, take a look at what I talked about earlier, is there's a uh, fair premium to be able to manage this in a more simplistic fashion. And one of the ways we do that is we integrate into the Microsoft platform. So you can see some instances here where we integrate in, uh, from the storage aspect into the virtual machine manager, into SCOM uh, for, uh, for some of the Hyper-V mobility pieces. You know, that's around binding that, that MAC address with a port profile. And then the application resource broker, which is the load balancing of VMs on our, uh, on our application delivery controller. Notably, this is the old single pane of glass here. So you can manage the entire Brocade portfolio from this element manager, Brocade Network Advisor. Northbound interfaces into the relevant Microsoft components um, supporting Link, um, as well as other applications. Also able to manage the storage and Ethernet uh, as a single environment, and the ability to accumulate, in the case of uh, the Ethernet side, S-flow statistics, and in the case of the storage side, management through SMIS. So very robust in terms of that operational efficiency and being able to gain a look into your network. 
So I said I'd talk a little bit about uh, subscription-based acquisition. So subscription-based acquisition is quite simply the ability for you as a user or a supplier to acquire a brocade product uh, without buying it outright as a capital purchase or buying it as a lease. You can acquire on the Ethernet side only, the Ethernet IP side, you can acquire a product um, that is equivalent to what you need. And if for some reason you've got a reorganization or you know, your business has shrunk and you've got too many ports, return to brocade. So the advent of cloud and the buy the drink service offerings has now bled over to the manufacturers who have said, in our case, well, we'll let you buy as much capacity as you need. And by the way, if you don't need that capacity, you can return it to us. So that's a, a unique concept. Uh, some other manufacturers have picked up on it. Um, right now, I think we're the only ones doing it on the network side. And as you can see, what it does, it just smooths out the entire acquisition model. I don't have to buy equipment in anticipation of a build out, and I don't have to worry about product getting stranded because my requirements shrunk. And is it kind of uh, technology upgrade insurance? Yeah, it kind of is, right? If a different platform comes out, well, you know what? That's no longer relevant. Take it back. Uh, by the way, what's the new platform look like? Now well, it looks like this, and it's only this much incremental delta, double negative. It's only this much delta to what you're paying right now. So a quick snapshot, and again, this is the portfolio I talked about. It's just some, uh, a quick snapshot. It's the uh, data center. It's the uh, campus environment. Uh, I put this up just to show that it's um, a fairly significant portfolio, all managed via a common element manager platform and a variety of different plugins and integration points. And a couple of quick commercials here. We did want to show uh, that on the partner side, those providing managed services, we've got Genesis, who really has just deployed everything that I talked about, the entire infrastructure, both Ethernet uh, and storage. They're using BNS as the acquisition model. Uh, so they kind of do the technology insurance uh, uh, paradigm that I talked about. And they've actually got a fairly successful business around providing Microsoft link services over a brocade infrastructure. Similar with OBT, uh, same thing. Uh, they're located, I believe, in Australia. Uh, but the same thing, they're providing managed link services. And uh, they use the brocade portfolio and some of the acquisition methods as well. I put that up there just because it's always somewhat comforting to know that you may not be the first person to do something, right? And so these guys have actually built businesses out on it. You know, this is not an enterprise saying, I'm going to serve my users. They live and die by their network infrastructure because they're delivering services. So with that, uh, I hopefully highlighted uh, our unique capabilities in terms of deploying a link environment um, and how you scale it without complexity, uh, as well as some of the other capabilities that Brocade in particular has in both the storage and the data network environment. We think we've got a unique value proposition for link. Um, as well as the data center and the campus in general. So with that, I will pause and see if there's any questions or any other topics that I can shed some additional light on. And again, I tried to hit it down the middle, so not in the technical minutia, but again, hopefully not too high up. So everybody got a, uh, hopefully, something that they were looking for. So questions? Ethernet fabrics, all that stuff came through, general understanding of it. OK. Well, we will be around the rest of the day. We'll be in the booth. Uh, we'll be here, I think, through tomorrow as well. Uh, so anyway, stop by and see us. Thanks for your uh, participation and attentiveness. Hopefully, you got some, uh, some material that uh, will give you pause for some thought and some consideration. Thank you very much.